Hey guys, it's Amandals here to ask which Sinnoh Pokemon broke the Generation 4 metagame and shattered it into a million pieces. I'm really stoked for this entry because I've got a particular interest with Gen 4. I've mentioned before that Gen 4 is kinda my least favorite gen and also least memorable, and that still kinda holds true today. However, this is the time in the Pokemon franchise when I began to battle competitively, so it really takes me back in that sense. It's even helped me realize that my team kinda sucked back in the day. I still love you, Cherim. Smogan doesn't know what they're talking about. Anyways, this is the fourth entry to my overpowered Pokemon series, and like the other entries, this list is going to exclude legendary Pokemon. To compensate though, you can expect next week's video to go over the legendaries of Sinnoh. And sorry if these reminders are obnoxious, but one last one. In this video, I'm talking only about Sinnoh Pokemon and only about how those Pokemon performed at the time. Lastly, sorry if a Pokemon that you thought would make this list didn't, but try to keep in mind that I did a lot of studying before making this video. And on that note, we can roll the video! Number 10, Roserade. Gen 4 was a generation that brought a ton of new evolutions to the Pokemon franchise. This meant loads of new viability and Pokemon that previously would have been shrugged off as nothing. Roserade is one of those Pokemon. What was once a forgettable Pokemon at best was now able to blossom into this gorgeous yet deadly Flower of Doom. And personally, I think Thorns would have been a flawless addition to Roserade's appearance, but hey, it's whatever. I'm nitpicking. Now, you might be asking yourself, how could something so beautiful also be so devastating at the same time. Well, for starters, Roserade is an amazing lead for setting up with toxic spikes, giving its access to sleep powder. Can't do much about my entry hazards now that you're sleeping, can you? Next, once you've been a pest and dealt the poison, Roserade can utilize its special attack quite well. With a 125 base special attack and a not too shabby 90 base speed, Roserade was really good at being a special sweeper. Sure, it's not as thorny as I'd like it to be, but Roserade is a great battler. Number 9, Togekiss. Another Pokemon that Game Freak spoiled with a new evolution when Diamond and Pearl hopped aboard the hype train was Togetic. And much like Roselia, this Pokemon really merited an evolution. Not only did it look unfinished and retained most of its newborn egg appearance, but Togetic couldn't do much in battle other than waggle its finger and hope for the best. Fortunately, Game Freak had a blimp-shaped solution to this that came in the form of Togekiss. Before it was the fairy type that you know today, Togekiss was an obnoxious normal flying type that had plenty of cool tricks to give the opposing trainers migraines. One downside to Togekiss is its vulnerability to stealth rocks, but that ain't nothing when compared to the Pokemon's strengths. Back in Gen 4, Togekiss was a Pokemon with some of the highest stats out of any other nasty plot user, and since its special defense was so good from the get-go, it was usually easy to use that move. Roost and Heelbell kept it and the team healthy and a wide move pool melted enemy Pokemon. Looks like Togetic had finally received the love that it needed. Number 8, Rotom Appliance. You may find it odd that I'm tying every Rotom Appliance form in this spot since today the Pokemon all fall into various different tiers. The reason they were so similar back in the day though was their lack of type changes upon changing form. Regardless of which household appliance Rotom chose to possess, the Pokemon's type would always remain a electric ghost. This isn't at all a bad thing though, and we'll get to why that is in a second. The only notable difference between the forms was the addition of getting a new move depending on which Rotom you had. It really just boiled down to whichever utility move you needed more. Referring back to Rotom's type, this meant that the Pokemon was only weak to ghost and dark types. This also gave it the amazing ability of becoming a spin blocker. This means, if you're unaware, that since rapid spin doesn't affect ghosts, you could switch into Rotom if you thought your foe was attempting to get rid of your entry hazards. Outside of this, Rotom is amazingly versatile with its well-balanced stats and packs a punch as a special sweeper. And the best part is, you were welcome to pick whichever one you wanted. Number 7, Hippowdon. This Pokemon has been a menace for quite some time now, and that was no different when the Pokemon debuted in its birthplace, Diamond and Pearl. We certainly had our doubts when its dopey pre-evolution Hippopotas reared its goofy mug. However, if there was any time to place a be careful who you make fun of in middle school joke, now would be the time. I say this because Hippopotas eventually grew up and made all of his haters bite the dust. Not only can Hippowdon pound helpless Pokemon into red mist with high attack stats, but the Pokemon can also hunker down and tank whatever enemies try to hit it with. And basically, if you're running a stall team that specializes in waiting for opponents to die, Hippowdon should be your go-to man for leading the charge. This is because A, Sandstream will activate when Hippowdon comes out, chipping away slowly at HP while your beefy hippo laughs in their face. And B, Hippowdon can bust out Stealth Rocks and spam Curse to increase its survivability. And in the end, who cares if your speed becomes non-existent and who cares about your little to none special defense? Hippowdon can obliterate with Earthquake and Stone Edge and survive an entire nuclear holocaust. Number 6, Mamoswine. In Generation 4, and well, in every other gen today, it's almost taboo to hear of people using Ice-type Pokemon competitively. However, don't let those people criticize you for using a Mamoswine, because this Pokemon is a living, breathing steamroller. It was certainly a good move for Game Freak to give this clump of hair an evolution, because that's pretty much all it was. A huge mass of hair. Mamoswine, however, is a primordial monster. First off, one word. Earthquake. 
Secondly, a 130 based attack means that Mammoth Swine can utilize even more moves that beat things to a bloody pulp. Try to pay no mind to Mammoth Swine's unfortunate weakness to steel, fire, water, and fighting. The Pokemon's benefits outweigh this minor setback. Furthermore, it's a Pokemon I'm a fan of because its formula for success is simple. Unleash a barrage of attacks. Alternatively though, you could slap on a Focus Sash to get Stealth Rocks out or bait an attack so you can use Endeavor. If you want advice from me though, I suggest you equip a Choice Band and go to town. I say this because look at how intimidating that shit looks. And well, a Choice Band does make attacks that much deadlier. Number 5, Frostlass. Giving Snowrunt a female exclusive alternative evolution to Glalie was an odd move, but a really successful one it turns out. This edgy, anti-social MySpace scene chick has insanely good utility and is fit to handle almost any situation. You need an attacker? Get yourself a Frostlass. You need entry hazards? Frostlass. You need a Pokemon that can perform a flawless harp cover of My Heart Will Go On? Well, okay, I don't know where you're going to find that, but point being, Frostlass is good. Given its awesomely immense speed stat, Frostlass can lay spikes onto the battlefield within the blink of an eye. Also, if you know your opponent is an entry hazard user themselves, taunt them. If they are a Pokemon that specializes in getting rid of entry hazards, all you have to do is exist and they won't get their job done. Since Frostlass is a ghost type, Rapid Spin simply doesn't affect her. Stab Shadow Ball hits really hard and you'd be surprised what an icy wind wielding Frostlass can do by lowering speed. A Focus Sash will ensure that the Pokemon gets at least some work done, and lastly, with its last breath of life, it can use Destiny Bond to take its foe with it. You're going nowhere! Number 4, Magnezone. Here's another Pokemon that uses odd utility to its advantage. And I do need to emphasize how odd does not equate to bad. Magnezone is extremely good with its rare but useful ability to trap steel types with Magnet Pole. With that ability, any foe that is a steel type simply cannot switch out when coming face to face with a Magnezone. You may not initially think that this is good since it only traps steel Pokemon, but it's important to know just how prevalent steel types were in this metagame. Once that's been settled, Magnezone can now do whatever it wants to its steel victim. In most cases, since the Pokemon's special attack, attack is very formidable, this means that Magnezone will take advantage of its ability by unleashing hard-hitting moves. Hidden Power, which can be whatever type it darn well pleases, is a great move for Magnezone to have. Flash Cannon and Thunderbolt are insanely useful as well against Pokemon that aren't Steel types. But if you do manage to catch a Steel type in your clutches, that is a prime opportunity to set up with Substitute. That, on top of Magnezone's great defenses, make this Pokemon really hard to kill. Oh yeah, and this is the point in the vid where I bring up EXPLOSION! Magnezone has frickin' EXPLOSION! Number 3, Lucario. Who needs Mega Evolutions? Not Lucario. This Pokemon was hyped up from the very beginning and became a fan favorite amongst loads of trainers. And I totally get it. Something about this Pokemon just screams super cool, stylish, anime-esque badass. I mean, he is voiced by the same guy who voiced Goku after all. Lucario has got something for everyone, whether it be style that you're looking for or just raw power. I for one am going to talk about the raw power side of things. To give you the short end of the story, let's just say that, yep, Lucario has raw power. Special, physical, the works. Lucario has it all. Though I would recommend going physical with Lucario since close combat is something that the Pokemon can abuse and in this guy's hands it does disgusting amounts of damage. Good disgusting, not bad disgusting. Also, given its accessibility to sword stance, the damage output goes from disgusting to just putridly godlike. Lucario is also great at surviving common threats such as dark moves, stealth rocks, and toxic spikes. Lastly, the priority move extreme speed and a life orb is a nice cherry on top of this destruction sundae. You done good, Goku. You done good. Number 2, Infernape. Lucario seemed like a pretty broken pick, didn't he? Well, what if I told you that Infernape was essentially a better version of Lucario? You what?! This monstrous ape that rocks a cool fire hat throws punches even better. Infernape doesn't have nearly as much survivability as Lucario, at least in most instances, but when it comes to attacking variety, Infernape wins the gold medal. And as much as I'd love to put the other starters on the pedestal here, they just don't hold a candle to this rage-fueled, hot-headed monkey. In the stat department, Infernape is doing everything right. It's not completely defenseless, and will outspeed most foes along with immense damage output. And good luck lowering Infernape's attack mid-battle, you're probably not going to do that due to the Pokemon's immunity to Will-O-Wisp. Tanking isn't really an option in most cases either, since Infernape's damage output far exceeds any Pokemon's ability to defend. Next, the move pool that he's working with is downright beautiful. Stone Edge, Stealth Rock, U-Turn, Flare Blitz, Close Combat, and Shadow Claw are just a few amazing picks. It's no wonder Simiseer is so unpopular when it has competition like this. Before we unveil the ultimate champ of Gen 
before, I'd like to include a few honorable mentions. Electivire. It's got solid versatility and is just all around a good electric type. Glyscor. It might not be the toxic orb nuisance that we know today, but Glyscor was no doubt good in Gen 4. Porygon Z. The special attack that this thing boasts is really scary. Weavile. Threatening, but can be hard countered by lots of Pokemon. Bronzong. Capable of supporting in an absurdly annoying amount of ways. Number 1, Garchomp. Coming in as essentially the Salamence of Gen 4, we have Garchomp as our number one pick. You see, back in these days, your precious fairy types weren't around to keep threats like this in check. That, among several other factors, meant that Garchomp went on a ruthless killing spree in Diamond and Pearl. Another factor is Garchomp's sky-high numbers. The Pokemon has survivability, ridiculous base attack, and speed that you definitely shouldn't write off as nothing. I mean, come on, it's a land shark for God's sake. Evolutionarily, it must be doing something right. Aside from defying nature, Garchomp does other nifty things things like wield an amazing move pool. Outrage is this guy's bread and butter as it stomps other dragon foes and is powerful against pretty much anything else in general. The Pokemon also boasts the almighty Earthquake and Stone Edge and everyone's favorite buffing move, Swords Dance. There are of course many more moves that Garchomp can abuse, but I think my point has been made. Aside from a few select legendaries, everything cowers in fear of Garchomp, thus crowning him the most overpowered Gen 4 Sinnoh Pokemon. Thanks for watching guys, if you enjoy my content be sure to subscribe and follow me on Twitter and Twitch if you'd like to see even more stuff from me. That's at Almighty Mandals for Twitter, and Twitch link is in the description. Also, be sure to leave a like and share if you enjoyed the video. As always, guys, stay sexy, and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.